to speak if no one prays. These very stones cry out. I am. Well, shalom, hello again, and welcome back to our series on archaeology, The Stones Cry Out. I'm surrounded by stone artifacts here in the burnt house in Jerusalem. This um, uh, house was uh, attacked by the Romans after they laid siege to the temple. Thirty days later or so, they came up this hill and they uh, raised this house and wrecked it and uh, left their spear here. And among the stone artifacts that were here in the house, the burn marks are everywhere. And it is uh, an archaeological find. You know, archaeology in general explains ancient history, but in Israel, it explains the Bible also. Uh, many scenes in the Bible guide archaeologists to where to dig, and vice versa. They dig and find something, go to the Bible and see that it does correspond. Uh, the Israel Department of Antiquities grants the uh, permits to the different people who want to do the archaeology here. Universities and societies participate uh, with Israel, and uh, there, there's so much more awaiting in the ground. You know, the whole Western world profits when these digs uh, uh, go on, and, and, and we certainly hope that they'll continue. Uh, there's a passage in Isaiah that tells us just what the dust can say to us. Isaiah 29, 4, And thou shalt be brought down, and shalt speak out of the ground, and thy speech shall be low out of the dust. And thy voice shall be as of one that hath a familiar spirit out of the ground, and thy speech shall whisper out of the dust. Dr. Tom McCall of our ministry will interview the archaeologist Professor Vasilios Tsaferis. <laughs> Vasilius, tell me about uh, where we are right now. Well, we're in the central court of uh, Rockefeller Museum, a museum which is, was built in uh, 1935 uh, by the British mandate in order to exhibit the archaeological finds from different sites which have been excavated since then and also to be in the center of the archaeological activities, the Department of Antiquities. And actually, it was the museum which, uh, in which all the finds from all the important excavations done uh, up to 1935 have been exhibited here. A 20-year field archaeologist and expert in early Christian churches, Professor Tsefiris has also studied the Biblical, Hellenistic, Roman, Byzantine, and Middle Ages. With all the places to dig in the we asked him why so many nations came to the tiny land of Israel. Christianity and uh, Judaism just were founded here. And uh, all the events uh, which are connected with the Old Testament and the New Testament took place in, in this surrounding. So everyone is coming here to uh, see, understand, and see what was happening. Uh, not only archaeologists, but also historians and even theologians. What are some of the institutes, the major ones that are involved? Well, first of all, a uh, lot of institutes from the United States, and that's, uh, I mean, they, they were the first uh, to come here. Uh, British institutes, uh, although lately the British Institute, uh, partly out of financial uh, difficulties, they uh, not increased, decreased their uh, interest in this country, but the French and the Italians and the Spain, even from Japan, institutes are coming every summer with their students and excavate and uh, above all of course the institutes uh, the academies from from Israel five universities they do have archaeological departments and every department is involved in some excavation and of course the uh, antiquities authority and we're doing most of the work in in the field of uh, what we call the salvage excavation because of the development in this country, which is very rapid, and many sites have been destroyed in this procedure of development, we are coming uh, to s save this uh, and to excavate and to save the information from these sites. We are no, not saving the sites because eventually they will be destroyed by the bulldozers, but we save the information and the evidence they are 
giving to us. Uh, so we're doing uh, a lot of work. Archaeology here in Israel has had a very fascinating past for something over 100 years, I guess. Uh, and many important discoveries have been made. Do you think there is a, much of a future for archaeology here? Well, first of all, uh, we excavate for a hundred years now, and uh, I can say that we excavated only uh, no more than 15 percent of our past. Uh, if you look on the sites which have been excavated 50, 60 years ago, only small portions of the sites have been excavated and the rest is left for the posterity. Uh, secondly, many of the sites which have been excavated just years and years ago, uh, now we have to come back again and check if uh, the assumptions of those archaeologists who worked 30, 50 or even 100 years ago, their the assumptions were right. So we have to check and update our uh, knowledge. So don't worry, uh, there is work for the archaeologists of the future. A splendid testament to the work of the Israelis is the Tower of David, or David Citadel. Now a museum, its massive walls, majestic ramparts, and imposing towers remain as an oracle of Jerusalem's history. I stopped outside to give an abbreviated story of this one-time fortress. Well, I'm standing in a Turkish archway on a kind of a portico in front of an ancient building, a building rebuilt many times, the kind of building that makes Jerusalem what it is and the kind of building you don't have in your city probably. Well, <laughs> very few cities in the world can uh, boast of such a place that has so many periods and so many different peoples associated with it. To begin with, it was King Herod's palace, and he built towers uh, to family members and so on. Uh, these towers are still here. When Titus and the Romans destroyed the city, and of course King Herod existed in, in uh, the period of the first century, in the period of Jesus and so on, uh, then that was conquered in 70 AD, the city was conquered, and Titus, the uh, a Roman general, ordered the, the, the place raised. I mean, it was destroyed, this building was largely destroyed, but he left the towers standing and the Herodian stones, those neat stones with the borders on each one that, that fit together without mortar, beautiful building Herod did, and uh, those stones were left in place and never torn down. Uh, the Romans gave them over to the Byzantine Christians uh, who are also associated with this building. This building is just inside the Jaffa Gate in the old city of Jerusalem, so it is a central and important site uh, to Jerusalem. The Byzantines gave way to the Muslims, and in their period they occupied the building. Uh, the Turks came in their time, uh, 1517 to 1917. And in 1917, uh, close to where I'm standing, uh, General Allenby, the British commander who took the city at that time, uh, announced that the uh, British troops had uh, taken Jerusalem. They had taken the place uh, without firing a shot. This was more of a, a uh, negotiated settlement, and Jerusalem was given over to a British mandate at that time. What has become of the building since then? Well, the British mandate gave way to uh, the uh, Jewish uh, uh, entry into Jerusalem in 1948 when the UN partitioned the land and uh, uh, a portion of Jerusalem given to the Jews. And uh, then there was the War of Independence and uh, the 1956 war with the Arabs. The 1967 war is very important to Jerusalem and to this building because at that time uh, the Jews came through here, conquered East Jerusalem, and occupied this part of the city. And in doing so, they acquired uh, what was left of this building, a hollowed out structure with high walls, and the tower still in place, built by King Herod, and Herod's stones all the way around, still standing, still reliably holding up the walls. And the Jews built here a very splendid museum and they called the place David's Tower, but it doesn't really go back to King David, but the towers, their, their enormity and splendor reminded uh, the, the Jews of the period of King David, and it's always been called David's Tower, David's Citadel. This old building, which has seen so many comings and goings, uh, so many periods, from the pagan Romans to the Christians of Byzantium to the Muslims, and finally the British and the Jewish, uh, is still up for, for negotiations and hopefully 
uh, there will not be uh, too much use of the sword again in, in whatever uh, befalls this place in the future. However the negotiations go, this building will be here, we'll see it again, we'll record it, and if the Lord tarries a thousand years, I'm sure we'll still be standing here to, to record the events of, of whatever happens in the interim period. When we return, we'll go inside the Citadel and speak with Bob Mullins, an American archaeologist living and working in Israel. We'll learn how his years of sifting the sands have affected his faith. It's really being able to put myself in the place of an ancient Israelite, uh, to stand in the house that they stood in, to see life from their perspective. And this really, I think, brings archaeology to much more of a human level. Come with Zola Levitt and see for yourself the land of the covenant. I've studied the Bible for 29 years, and now every passage I read, I see something that reminds me of where we've been. It'll never be the same again. I can't wait to go back and read the New Testament again and underline all the places that we've been and things we've done. Tour the Holy Land with Zola Levitt. Call or write for more information. Bob Mullins has been with us before. He's an archaeologist in Israel for many years. He studied at the Hebrew University there, and he now teaches archaeology at the Institute of Holy Land Studies in Jerusalem. I asked him if archaeological digs really illuminate the Bible. Well, the first excavation that comes to mind is the first dig I ever worked on myself in 1972, a little Philistine outpost just north of Tel Aviv, northern outskirts of Tel Aviv, called Tel Kassila. Along the Mediterranean along coast. Along the Mediterranean coast, exactly. Uh, this site was being excavated by Amichai Mazar, who was writing his doctoral dissertation on this particular Philistine site. And in the summer I joined the excavation, uh, we started excavating at the highest point of the mound and eventually came across evidence for a Philistine temple, oh, yeah. which is the only uh, or really one of the few examples we can point to of a Philistine place of worship. Now what was most interesting about this particular shrine was that the floor plan, the design of the shrine, was similar to the temple described in the book of Judges where Samson was placed between two pillars and pushed away the pull pillars and the roof uh, the fell, whole thing fell down. And so exactly. it was supported, the roof was supported by two pillars? The roof the was one? supported by two pillars um, according to uh, judges with this temple in Gaza, yeah. um, as well as what we found in our excavations at Tel Kassila. Although there the temple is much smaller in size, but still the same floor plan, the same design. So evidently the architect followed a similar plan to uh, the temple that, that Samson was in. Exactly. Yeah. The Bible passage referred to as Judges 16.29 and Samson took hold of the two middle pillars upon which the house stood, and upon which it was borne up, of the one with his right hand, of the other with his left. And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all his might. And the house fell upon the lords and upon the people that were therein. This sketch, based on archaeological finds, showing the two pillars in the design of the Philistine temple, gives proof of the validity of this scripture. Were there other sites then that, that uh, illuminated the uh, scripture for you? Uh, there are several. Uh, probably another one that comes to mind is right here in Jerusalem. Uh, in 1977, I worked in a small area of the Jewish quarter. Now, up to that time, there was debate among scholars as to whether the Jerusalem of, let's say, Isaiah and Hezekiah's time was limited to what is known as the Eastern Hill an area of the city which was Jerusalem in the time of Solomon, or whether it had grown to a much greater extent, even reaching as far as Jaffa Gate and the Citadel Museum where we're located right now. Yes. Mm -hmm. And what became very clear in these excavations is that indeed there was in Hezekiah and Isaiah's time an expanded Jerusalem all the way out to Jaffa Gate, which means that uh, during that time, as well as at the time that Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonians in 586, Jerusalem was a 150-acre city rather than a city of, let's say, 40 acres, which was the size of Solomon's city. And some scholars up until then were still believing that Jerusalem never grew beyond Solomon's 
uh, boundaries. So archaeology in that case really did en en enrich your knowledge of scripture and, exactly. and also verified. Uh, exactly. You know. And I think for many archaeologists, um, it, these are both sides of interest. On the one hand, uh, many archaeologists want to see correlations between the Bible and history and archaeological remains. On the other hand, they're interested in the whole picture, not just answering historical questions and problems, but understanding life in, in all of its levels, including how did the people look, uh, what did their houses look like, what kind of foods did they eat, how did they prepare their foods, uh, why did they build their temples in the way they did, uh, to what degree did climate affect the way that people lived? These are all larger questions that archaeologists are interested in. And in the process, you are always finding historical details and archaeological finds that will have direct bearing on the Bible. And when we make those connections, it can be very nice. Oh, I'm sure. But how, how do you determine what people ate, for example? <laughs> how? Well, one thing we can do is we can go to um, other ancient texts outside of the Bible. We have, for example, recipes really? from both Egypt and Mesopotamia. Uh, yeah. uh -huh. uh, we know from the Bible the kinds of foods that people ate, the wheat and the barley, and of course the seven varieties of the land that are mentioned in Deuteronomy chapter 8. Uh, we can also use scientific tests that uh, will test residue inside containers, such as cooking pots or storage jars. And through this, we can say that a certain vessel contained olive oil or wine or cheese or some other substance. How do you view the uh, diets of ancient people? Was it pretty good or is that like ours? Or? Um, they tended overall to eat uh, much less meat. Meat uh -huh. was more for special occasions, uh -huh. more vegetarian in their diet. Uh -huh. um, and I think in many ways, probably more healthy. But on the other hand, uh, we can study for example, uh, in the city of David, uh, where they found an ancient toilet, they found human feces uh, petrified and surviving 3,000 years. And we know that along with the foods they ate, they also ingested parasites and had all kinds of intestinal problems. Mm. And we can determine these. Uh, we also know, for example, from caves nearby the Dead Sea, where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, that uh, combs uh, showed evidence of head lice. And oh, so people yeah. would deal with these kinds of problems. Uh, Bob, you mentioned the Dead Sea Scrolls. We've made a series about those. Of course, they are uh, writings of the uh, of 200 years before Christ to about 50 uh, A.D. Mm -hmm. Certainly Jewish writings about Jewish books, Bible books, etc., in Hebrew and Aramaic. And Correct. So on. But these were found deep in the West Bank. Mm -hmm. The political issue seems to be that uh, the the uh, the Arab peoples who are here say that's in their land, so it belongs to them. There's no question that uh, the people that were in the area of Qumran, in the area of the Dead Sea, were a Jewish sect, most probably the Essenes. But as you referred to, uh, with Palestinians, there is the feeling that they have claim, legitimate claim to the land, and so they're looking for whatever they can in the way of historical data that will give them legitimacy. And this is a real problem they're faced with, uh, because in terms of significant Arab presence in this country, uh, we can't speak of much before the country was conquered by the Muslims in 639 A.D. Now, we do have in the Hebrew Bible references to the Ishmaelites, which would have been people of Arabian descent. And most certainly, people of Arabian stock were present in various points in this country. But in mass, as a large people, we can't really say any earlier than the 7th century A.D. So that when people say the Palestinians are an ancient people who have always vied with the Jews for the land, it's, it's just a fable, really. Yes, in a certain sense. The only thing that one could say is that whenever you have, let's say, a people like the Arabs coming in and taking control of the Holy Land, there is going to be intermarriage with the local population. Now, I would not be surprised if some people that are Christian Arabs today did not marry Jewish Christians, uh -huh. you know, and intermarry. Um, and probably even if one were to go further back, you would find a certain amount of intermarriage and mixture of blood with other indigenous people or people that would come through this country. Because don't forget that uh, Israel is a land bridge between three continents. Yes. And so anyone passing between Asia, Europe, and Africa is going to come through this country. 
And so there's always been a lot of people from different backgrounds, a lot of intermarriage and mixing of blood. But all right, the, the idea that Palestinian today, that term mm -hmm. is now used to refer to Arabs in, in the land, goes back to the Philistines. Exactly, yeah, that's what's been claimed. And uh, this is a problem historically, because uh, what we know is that ne uh, Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of Babylon, conquered Philistia in 605. And following that, we really don't hear anything about the Philistines. They, they were eliminated. They were eliminated um, in the sense that probably those who were not killed or deported were absorbed into the larger Jewish population. Um, of course, by 586, we have more deep Deportations by Nebuchadnezzar. And so uh, here, too, um, we're dealing with a people that have disappeared from the stage of history um, after a century or two. And we can't really point to an ethnic entity that we can call Philistines anymore. Now, where we start getting some of the problems is that um, Hadrian, who was a Roman emperor of the second century AD, after he crushed the second Jewish revolt against Rome in 135, he called this country Palestina, Palestine, um, basically um, as a way of insulting the Jewish population by calling the country now after their traditional enemy rather than the name it had been known up to then, which was Judea. Mm -hmm. So he picked that name uh, just almost, well, political reasons. Exactly. <laughs> but to call exactly. this place Palestine and remind you of your old nemesis, the Philistines. But this had nothing to do with Arab people in any way. No, and, and in terms of ethnicity, no. And especially since uh, the Philistines, from what we know from Scripture, as well as from archaeology and historical sources, were people of Aegean origin. They're not of Arabian stock at all. They were an Indo-European people. So th there's just no connection from today's Palestinian back to the Philistines. It's, it's purely a, a political connection. It wouldn't make a very good claim to no, land. No, it wouldn't. Uh, okay, I, I want to talk to you not just about politics, or not even just about archaeology, but about faith. Yes. Because you're a Christian and, mm -hmm. and you dig in this soil, which is a great privilege, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. It is. A ministry. And uh, you get knowledge, and it builds your faith, doesn't it? Yes. What I enjoy most about archaeology, even more than trying to answer specific historical questions, such as was there an exodus or a conquest, and these kinds of things that are very much at the forefront of controversy today, it's that broad picture. It's really being able to put myself in the place of an ancient Israelite, uh, to stand in the house that they stood in, to see life from their perspective. And this really, I think, brings archaeology to much more of a human level, is that I realize that, you know, they struggled with the same issues I struggle with. And in many ways, they had it tougher than me, because we live in very comfortable, heated homes with wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. These people lived in mud brick houses that were about fourth the size of many of our homes. Uh, they were cold leaky this time of the year where we get rainfall and cold winds. I'm sure many people suffered from the cold and the rain and died of uh, diseases. Uh, and so there was, for them too, a real struggle of faith. And um, what does it mean to really trust in God, that God is here to meet my needs uh, when it seems that sometimes the odds of life are so much against me. And so I can see life from their perspective and that in itself will enrich my faith. Well, Tom, archaeology seems to, to strengthen the archaeologist's faith. <laughs> this find of the, of the two posts of Samson is remarkable. Yeah, it was a smaller temple than what's described in the uh, book of uh, Judges there with Samson. Uh, that was in Gaza. They'll never be able to excavate Gaza because it's an occupied city. But in uh, Tel Aviv, they found this uh, little Philistine town called Tel Kassila. And it had a smaller temple, but it was probably built on the same plan. And right there, holding uh, with a supporting weight, 
those two central pillars, mm -hmm. uh, not more than five feet apart. A man and you, can reach. Uh, and you uh, can imagine uh, Samson standing between those yeah. pillars and pulling the weight of the whole temple down. Gosh. Well, the prophecy uh, uh, talks about the elimination of the Philistines. and uh, Yes, in, in Zephaniah we have the uh, prophecy about uh, how that the Jewish people upon the return to the land would occupy the coast and the place of Ashkelon. And, uh, of course, that was where the Philistines were, and they've disappeared from sight. Oh, yes, in the houses of the Philistines will they lie down in the evenings, my people of Judah, after their captivity. That's right. So there are no more Philistines, but there are certainly Jewish people all over the world, and especially in Israel. Yeah. And it's really striking, according to Vesilius, who is really important in the Israeli archaeology, uh, only 15% of the archaeology has been found. Yeah, we, we asked him, how, how much more uh, work is there to be done here? And he said, well, we've been working for a hundred years and only 15% of the work has been done so far. So there's lots more to go. Gosh. Sounds Even, like a lot of programs. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it sure does. In the times we've taken our tours in, in 25 years, I have learned a lot because new digs keep, keep being excavated. Fascinating. Our Levitt letter is free. The catalog is free. Just send us your name and address. Uh, look for our uh, web page on the computer. And Sha'alu, Shalom, Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem.